Ibrahim, I think your mic is on. We're going to mute you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Hope, can you just make a list? Uh, let's do... What was your project? The water. Okay. Uh, and is that in... There's a Fred Park yes. that you're ready to share? Yeah. Yeah? Be yeah, it doesn't... I mean, you know, uh, the point is now, this is your time where you can take brain cycles from everybody else here because everybody's thinking about... So wherever you are, it's time. So let's do that first. Then let's do... I don't know if Henry will be like... Let me text them. Uh, we could okay. delay it a little. At least yeah. I want it to be listed yeah, because, uh, you know, these are the only all team uh, brainstorming sessions. After this. Oh, and my wife got the open defecation. Yes. So, Tushar, uh, you're also on the open defecation project team, right? Yeah. So, we'll yeah. Do yeah. That. And we'll change the sequence or the order that Hope is writing this in. I just want to list all the projects. Uh, so that covers everybody in this room, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, folks online, uh, if raise your hand if your project has not been discussed. Fred Park hasn't been discussed as a group together. So, and just tell the name of the project so that we can just decide. We'll spend basically... 10, 15 minutes on each project. So Webhav, can you remind me? I clearly know Nima. We haven't discussed the microplastics, the final version yet. So let's write microplastics. Uh, we cover Jujo. Other folks, uh, I know we covered Manal. Webhav, can you remind me which team you're in? Uh, Systomiosis diagnostic. Okay. Professor. So we discussed that. Uh, Ibrahim, can you remind me which team you're in, Ibrahim? Uh, anybody else? I see lots of people, but I don't think we have covered most of the projects. I just want to make sure that every... Okay, I see Jenny, non-communicable diseases. Uh, and I think this is with Late. And I haven't seen Late for a little. Was he here last week? Uh, yeah, why don't we write that down? Uh, so this is communicable disease diagnostics, non-communicable. Uh, cholesterol. So I think the point is, even if you're not ready, time will pass. So I want you to kind of use this time to narrow so that you are ready the next time. Uh, anybody else? Is that all the projects? And then let's just write the projects we have discussed. Uh, so that we can all put all projects in our heads. So we've discussed the Osmi bags. We've discussed Shishto. We have discussed eco-monitoring. What else did we cover last week? Is that it? I think it's Cassava. Cassava, yes. Honzo. Uh, and that was this four, right? Uh, Pavan, go ahead. Yeah, so so we kind of did discuss the X-ray thing, but no, no, not no, not the... not not thoroughly. So I not think thoroughly, that would yeah. be the time we really narrow yeah, down and yeah, explicitly yeah. say. So I would like to now put that in, as so, long as you are committed to that project primarily this quarter, right? Okay, yeah. So can you yeah. write hope, uh, low cost X-rays on the sixth side? Yeah. Um. So I have a list of 10 projects on the board now. That means that is the everybody else is somewhere accounted for in this space of 10 projects, right? Okay, if that's the case, let's get started. Uh, who wants to go first? Oh, Pranaya, I see your hand raised, sorry. Yeah. So uh, mine was a uh, vaccine carrier, but uh, as of now, I'm alone, like I'm by myself. I see. And were you thinking of joining any other team or pursuing that yourself? That's perfectly okay. It's just a question of uh, making a choice at this point. Yeah. So I'm thinking of going ahead with it. Okay. That's great. So let's discuss yeah. that. So we'll kind of, can you add uh, hope uh, vaccine carriers? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so I'm just going to randomly get started. Let's start with open defecation first. So if you guys want to choose a Fred Park, 
Tushar and what was your name again? You have to say that again. Dakshini. Okay. Uh, is there anybody else in the team? No, it's just two of us. Okay. Yeah. Can Tushar, you sh do the share and then Dakshini, you can be on the board. Just yeah. Uh, so walk through the Fred Park. And again, we're going to do the same drill. Everybody should be involved. This is sort of your time you're committing to other teams. Uh, and let's narrow down so that there is uh, concrete executables that come out of it. So Tushar, take it away. Yep. Can you see the screen? Yeah. And then folks yeah, okay. can just keep going on Zoom. That might just be easier because this board doesn't work. Right. So I'll just quickly give a, a bit of context. So uh, I'm targeting this state of Haryana uh, in Delhi, which is like the neighboring state of India's capital. Um, so there are about 30, lakh, uh, 30 million people uh, in Haryana, but very like a lot of them do not have access to uh, public toilets or you know any form of toilet. So um, and that is actually a huge problem because a large population dies uh, because of the diarrheal diseases that are caused by op open defecation. So there are a lot of root causes. Yesterday, Daksiani and I talked yes, about so it. I don't and... know if you guys can see that number. That number, that what I see is uh, 600,000 deaths purely because of diarrheal diseases. Diarrheal diseases right. are one of the largest cause of child mortality across the world. So it's, it's and most diarrheal diseases are fecal to oral transmission. Yeah, go ahead, Tushar. Right. So like even in, you know, 2014, there was a survey conducted uh, where they identified that 10% uh, of all children in Haryana under five died because of these diarrheal diseases. Mm -hmm. So that's actually quite a significant number. So um, there was this another study that they conducted and they found out that uh, in a region like where there are 100 million women, they have access to only 80 toilets. So sorry, 10 million women have just 80 toilets to use. Mm -hmm. So that's like extremely low in 2011. And after that, on 2014, the government of India, they started this initiative of creating public toilets. But since then, they have only created 600,000 toilets. So 600,000 toilets uh, for 10 million, that's still pretty low, right? Uh, and still, uh, you know, even in a lot of places, there are like huge radius of areas where there are no toilets at all. Uh, now the problem yeah, lies- a comment, Since you brought up the government yeah, of India yeah. program, can you say a little bit about, because you are in Haryana, what is the current status? Uh, what's the logistics around uh, the way or the process in which the toilets are created? Are they owned by people? Are they owned by the government? Do you guys know anything about the program? Mm -hmm. The people and they are responsible under 20% of the but to be honest, I've yeah. seen that uh, in reality, what people do is like they just take the money, but never really use it. Mm -hmm. for, like, so you mean that this is a scheme yeah. in which you get financial aid to build a toilet? Mm -hmm. I see. And then still, if the incentives and the educational framework is not there, that wouldn't go. But then there is a physical toilets that are also directly built by the government that are owned by the... I'm just thinking a little bit about Haryana and Delhi because I'll have you guys talk to Anoop uh, very soon. I want to make sure that we understand the model in Haryana. Are there any community toilets? Like, are there NGOs and organizations that run and maintain high-quality toilets? Henry, well, you that's just some that... you wanna... Oh, you got yeah. it okay. Yeah, Henry comes in with his chair. Yes, sorry. Yeah, any uh, whether or not there are NGOs on the community toilet side. Yeah, NGOs and stuff have not looked them up. Okay. But the thing is, uh, what the government does is, uh, they form like you know there are some groups of people, uh, whom the government gives money, and then the you know the those groups are um, responsible for creating the toilets. Now the, uh, the the thing is, the government gives ten thousand rupees for one toilet. Uh, yeah. But there are cases where people have reported that they have they do not have money to create toilets because these toilets are not created. Yeah. So where yeah. does the money go? We don't know. Yeah. And then can you explain, you know, most of you know this already, that the Gates Foundation has funded massively in the space of toilets. And what was ironic and very interesting from a technology point of view, they ran a hackathon. I mean, not really a hackathon, but more of a competition 
I think Caltech won that competition at that time. And they went ultra high tech in terms of completely untethered because, you know, a toilet is not a building. It's not also kind of the physical interest. It's you have to connect it to a sewage system that then processes much of that material. And so in places where that doesn't exist, I'm just confused. What gets put in in 10,000? I mean, are these kind of open pit systems? Do you guys know technically, are these composting systems? Like what is the technology behind the 10,000 rupees toilet? Which actually is pretty impressive from a cost point of view. Uh, yesterday we were talking about it and we realized that it's not enough for a proper toilet to be built. Yeah, but what is it? You know, still like what, when somebody goes out there and says, here's 10,000 rupees, what are they actually putting? Uh, do we know what exactly gets put uh, as uh, what is called a toilet when we report this number that X number of things have been created? It's just valuable to understand because there might be a contextual reason they chose that technology per se. Yeah. Right. So uh, I could not find the materials and stuff that they used, but the way that a toilet looks is, is it's like a very small, uh, you know, structure uh, and, and, and closed yeah, structure. I'm more within... interested in the back end of the technology. Yeah, so what the really happens straight. after, uh, mm -hmm. say, human waste is collected? Where does it go? Is it open compost? Is it is there a collection scheme? I'm not very sure about it. Today. Yeah, so let's dig in into that because I think that would just yeah. kind of on your background, uh, let's explicitly write down and do this for a couple of different countries. You might actually mm -hmm. find uh, that different sets of things because this is a very large problem and lots of people have tackled it. So I think it would be huge to make sure and then these sets of documents should be quite transparent because the program is very visible. Right. Uh, uh, also, also, you know, another issue like uh, in a lot of articles and stuff that are mentioned uh, is that the like a lot of people say that the problem is not the construction of toilets because there are initiatives, there, there are money for creation of that. But the problem is maintenance. Uh, like toilets are created, but after a month or so, they are not used because they are not maintained properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this is something what I also heard from Anoop, which is really why I'm pushing for this community model, where there is a collective responsibility around maintenance and thinking a little bit about technical solutions around reporting a status of a toilet, for example, or uh, threads that tell you how many of the sets of toilets are actually online in some sense. Currently, what is their current state? Uh, and then again, you know, uh, the other space to think a little bit about is uh, the business model itself, you know, creating the kinds of incentives uh, where the uh, facilities would be maintained. Uh, so in, in terms of the Fred Park, what, where are you guys landing uh, in terms of Say, what is the most important functional requirement that you guys want to focus on in the quarter? I mean, it so, could be uh, really toilet yeah. as a technology. It could okay. really be maintenance and much more of a community structure around. Yeah. Yeah. Or it could be like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would just write FR there. So I think I now see the the Fred Park is right there. I would break down the functional requirements in terms of just uh, the toilet as a technology, which is how do you actually manage waste? And that divides into a massive number of streams all the way from historic threads around composting, there is a huge amount of work that's currently done on uh, these small scale wastewater management systems. Uh, there is a scale of uh, sets of projects that are associated with zero infrastructure toilets, which is really kind of the high end of what Gates Foundation funded. So incineration and other sets of, I mean, you have to rely on electricity then, then you don't need plumbing. 
So the idea that nothing comes out of it in the end, everything is turned into carbon of some kind. Uh, so that's one space. Uh, there is, I'm seeing the other requirement can really be around maintenance. So I would kind of divide this in uh, uh, the explicit functional requirement would really be is the toilet as a product. That's one. The second one is around maintenance. So do you want to say anything on the maintenance side, sets of ideas? And then let's discuss between the two, which one would you both prefer? And then let's have an open discussion uh, around one of the two. Uh, before we jump into it, I just wanted to yeah. add this point of desirability. So like a lot of people also, you know, in those articles I read mentioned that uh, even though toilets are built and stuff, people like after some time, they just go back to openly defecating because that's what they've been doing since they were born. So uh, there's this need of, you know, having them yeah. break out of the habits yeah. they so have let's had. That as a functional requirement, which be a social uh, yeah. context and education being uh, an agenda item that you guys pick up. So social slash education. Um, and also like some people have some sort of like religious that they do not have to hide it in the same house mm -hmm. where they Yeah. So can you write that as a there as a in it would be in the same framework. Uh which is just belief systems. Uh and again, you know, this idea of knowing uh, I mean something that's we've thought quite deeply about this idea of teaching germ theory. You know, we know where diarrheal diseases come from. And then this idea that uh, there are microbes that make people sick is not a, it's not such an easy concept to even teach uh, because we don't have very direct evidence sometimes associated with it. Uh, okay, so Tushar, amongst the three, just for the discussion right now, between maintenance, yep. toilet as a technology, and the social yep. educational aspects, which one do we want to discuss? It's okay later on, you might say, oh, we are pivoting towards something else. But I just want to very narrowly focus on one of the three. Which one are you guys leaning towards? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think desirability should, uh, could, like the social and education aspect could be something you can focus on. But what does Dakshian think? Dakshian is leaning towards maintenance. That's what I heard. Okay. <laughs> She's okay. open to everything. Um, let's just for, okay. for time case, let's just focus mm -hmm. on maintenance. Yeah, just as sure. a, you know, I think uh, the, the, the thread, thread around this is, oh, oh. Hmm? okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, uh, so let's just, uh, now this is open. Uh, let's just all chime in. Uh, what would be the breadth of solutions that you all feel from a maintenance point of view? Uh, you know, we could start writing something on the extreme side, which is autonomous systems. You know, why do we assume that people uh, have to do that? There is, uh, in so there is, that's an extreme set of a solution, uh, which is associated with uh, technical solutions that make zero maintenance toilets, for example. So you can write that as one spectrum. And then I'm just curious, people have any comments about uh, uh other threads, uh, what could be done in a short time scale to both understand this problem uh, and also build rigor uh, in a manner that uh, systems that are put together are actually maintained. So ideas. Um, I have this one point, yeah, like ahead, the sure. way that yeah, uh, the way the toilets are used in airplanes and spaceships and maybe submarines, uh -huh. uh, the way that they're maintained. Airplane, submarines, yeah. that's a phenomenal idea. Uh, right. Yeah, go ahead. I was just thinking, I was in Costa Rica once and then I was in this kind of like village thing from a French woman that built it. And the I think she had just moved there 10 years ago and this place was nothing before and it was completely clean. And the reason why is that all of the defecation from each of the toilets in each hut was being composted and then used to fertilize everything around it. So maybe having a relationship of like a co-product 
from the toilets to the ecosystem yeah. that people are living in might yeah. be good for the social. Yeah, and I think the co-products are really starting to, at least on the science side, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, that in our pee is plenty gold. So, uh, you know, uh, a future gold miners might just be collecting human pee. Uh, right now, the energy it takes to extract gold out of human pee is too high, but you could reduce that. I mean, that's an extreme case. Compost is a co-product that's a very low hanging fruit. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I think I saw another hand raised. Henry. Yeah, um, similar on a similar vein, um, carbon energy takes water in the fermentation plant. Yeah. In there, they were talking about, um, I think, in the city in Haiti, they had, they gave, it was this whole program to try to get toilets, and they used container-based toilet system. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, the system they provided um, included, um, it didn't require any water, and so they added, they gave them this material that sort of, uh, reduces the odor, mm -hmm. um, and then someone would come and collect the container every mm -hmm. uh, like period, uh, periodically, mm -hmm. um, and then they would convert that into yeah. compost yeah. and this whole other. Yeah, thing. and so then it's uh, the, it's the, set up as a business. So yeah, can you send that, post that on the thread or just on Discord directly? Uh, and then again, you know, what's very interesting is it covers product, toilet as a product, and maintenance simultaneously, that it's co-designed in a manner that the container gets picked up. Uh, and then again, you know, it has to have a very rigorous, and you could think about, oh, for population densities. So uh, Tushar, and uh, it would be very valuable to make sure that you guys are choosing a demographics. So we have a sense of density that you are trying to serve. Because what Henry just said, might work for a very high density population, might not be viable for a rural population. Okay, I see Pavan's hand. Go ahead, Pavan. Yeah, so uh, one of the other factors, which at least from what I've read, is the access to water. And that kind of uh, limits the usability of the toilets, uh, especially because they consume far more water than open defecation. Uh, and I was considering my parents are building a house and they have these um, uh, black water treatment systems, which is no energy, no electricity, just gravity. And they let it sit in yeah. multiple barrels. And then there is, in some sense, phytoremediation where there's a bunch of uh, grass reeds which grow on the lake bed. And then you have water, which is sort of gray, which you can use for agriculture and other things. Uh -huh. And that's one option without using any electricity or incineration, which could be considered, especially because it's a low resource setting. Yeah. And rainwater yeah. if you needed to clean it. And you can also use the same thing for the gray water because gray water is easier to treat and you can use that for, for uh, flushing down the toilets for the black water and then sort of cycle it as much as you can. Mm -hmm. uh I love the idea, Pavan, and I think what you're hitting to is in some sense the reason for uh, ill maintenance might just actually turn out to be a water access issue because just the most traditional tool that we use for cleaning toilets is just water itself in a place where water is scarce. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and open defecation uses less water than... Yeah. Norm, the conventional toilets, yeah. far I'm more. Curious, That's, yeah. A couple of lived experiences came along. You mentioned Costa Rica. Anybody knows on uh, refugee camps and other threads, what's the what's the classic uh, toilets that are built? Because camps, they have to be built pretty quickly. And they're kind of temporary structures, so they don't have that infrastructure. And it's also high density. You don't mind, no. I can ask the one I was in, yeah. in Jordan. I guess what you was more the that permanent. Was like over the, so that one had okay. like when we were there, it had normal toilets. But yeah. I know the organization also also go to goes to Lebanon. So that uh -huh. one, they're like intense. So yeah, I, I think ask. one thing that you guys should also just do is map a little bit that there might be other technologies that are out there in this space that just aren't made available in other contexts. So maybe what's uh, being deployed in camps, for example, or what might be uh, being thought about uh, terraforming Mars might actually have much better use thinking about here. So I think, I mean, I love the idea of, uh, you guys should, although we're focusing on maintenance, 
maintenance cannot be thought independently of the kind of a toilet itself. Mm -hmm. So I think at some point of time, either you are choosing a specific product that exists, or you have to go back and say, oh, this is one of the tools. And I think from a time perspective in the class, my intuition would be is choose a novel solution that a lot of people have already worked on, find why it's not being adopted and find the maintenance thread around it and then really focus on maintenance. Like, I mean, you know, what Henry mentioned or many of these threads that are listed here, uh, I think that would be my suggestion. You guys can completely change, but this is too large a problem. Uh, you guys will okay. just get lost. Uh, so to make it extremely concrete, uh, either primarily focused on the product side, and then you can also narrow that down further. Zero water toilets is in some sense the most exciting technical problem that you guys could work on. I mean, this is very, very clear. It's not so obvious why we need water. Why do we need this centralized infrastructure? And so I think, I mean, there is a lot of work that's been done in this space, uh, but that would be one extreme that I would take, or I would suggest take a tool that's already working, being deployed. You could start with just literally what the government is doing, and you're saying it's not working. And if that's the case, just what is the layer that's needed for it to work? Because there is somebody else that has an incentive of putting these sets of infrastructures in place too. So I think really digging down, you guys should put together, I want to see a detailed sheet that has, if somebody gets 10,000 rupees in Haryana, what gets built? How many times is it used? And it might be that they've actually cracked the problem and we're not giving them credit for it. Or it's the other way around, that it's a label and there is no sustenance of that solution. And then what would you do to actually make that system? And then it would be useful to think about who is in charge. Like if you were to say maintenance, you should have another arrow around people because maintenance is a, there is a human purview to it. Like whose job is it to see to it? I mean, is it the district collectors? Is it where in the government does that lie? What kind of human incentives could actually be created around, you know, a lot of incentives that have been built uh, in education and threads have been around cell phone minutes. Imagine if uh, the person that does take care of a toilet gets X number of cell phone minutes, right? I mean, there are sets of kind of these financial incentives that have been built to lean people towards reducing over because it's a public health solution. I think one thing to remember is you guys are really working on a public health solution because at the end of the day, what matters is that the number of diarrheal diseases go down. So it would be useful to think about in the last five years, what has that trend looked like with the current infrastructure in place? So, you know, just like I was saying to other folks that you need something to test, your real test is thinking a little bit about the tool that is put together reduces, that's the bottom line, that it reduces contamination of uh, other water sources. I think yesterday me and Kushal were talking and we also like Kushal came up with this idea that um, one thing which we can have is like if we have to post public toilet and in like a village. So we can keep track of like how many times the person is using yeah. the, the toilet. Yeah. And like the waste after we manage it and kind of we make like fertilizer out of it or something, a part of it can be given it's back to the, to the person. person. Oh, that's a beautiful, it's a very interesting co-product, but you own it. The gold I definitely want. <laughs> this is so funny. That force people no, that's a very them. interesting thing. If they kind of realize that if you use the toilet once or X number of times a year, this is income that's coming through. So I would, yeah, I would write that down. Uh, this is the incentive schemes to think about. And I think again, uh, tying up cell phones and other sets of threads in terms of tracking and recording. You know, you don't have to track which person, but it's useful to know how many uses does something get. Because without data, it's very hard to say where is the bottleneck. And then once you guys have documented this well, I'm going to set up a call with Anoop. Uh, and he yep. will share with, I think I may, might as well just ask him to talk about his journey and why he started that NGO for the whole class. 
uh, and then you guys can have a private discussion around. And of course, you know, he has come to this realization that the only way to tackle this is community-based infrastructure. Thinking of toilets not as a personal object that just you don't have the financial means for that, but a community resource. Like, you know, just like there is a community center where people's weddings happen, there is a fruit market where you go and buy groceries, there is this community center associated with uh, defecation. Uh, okay, so we're going to switch topics. So Tushar, do you want to switch uh, screens? Uh, who wants to go next? Uh, in my list, I have clean water, uh, I have microplastics, and solar-powered HTO amongst the top four. So you guys ready? Our topic, so it's not clean water anymore. What is it? It's uh, low cost uh, tent heater. Okay. Can you do a Fred Park share and then remove? Uh, unfortunately, nobody's gonna get clean water to the world, but at least we will uh, will make people warm, which is all good. <laughs> and then, who all is in the team? How many people in the team? Three. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, yeah. So if you just share screen. Oh, this is nice. If here people always sign in, I can associate names to faces. And that way I know actually who I'm addressing. Because this is funny. I see people on Zoom often and I see face and name written right there. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, you just hit share. Um, yeah, but Irene, Irene, Irene can yeah, you just do that? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to try to keep time because uh, we're covering four or five things. Let's do 10 minutes each. That way we have some time for open discussions and other threads. Okay, so now you guys are being timed. Okay, go, go, go. Okay, so um, this idea sort of stems from um, Kavi and I built these like tent heaters. Um, I think it was a year ago, um, and then we went and handed them out to an um, encampment up in Tokyo. Um, and so when building those, yeah. this is in the context of a homeless community, for example. Yes, um, and so and they were pretty low cost already. I think mm -hmm. uh, ours cost twelve dollars, but what we were basing on. Uh, basing it on it's cost like seven per unit, mm -hmm. um, but then they had a lot of issues. Of yeah, issues. can we see it? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah I can share this. Photo. Yeah, I think it's very important. You should have just brought it. Do you have one? Oh, we yeah, we can. Them. Okay. You don't even have a prototype. I have pictures. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Build one, like today. Like if we're gonna improve something, it's very important to just hold it in our hands. Um, it's based off of this, there's a network of people like across the country who mm -hmm. would use this um, like document to build them. Okay, yeah. Um, so what's, uh, who came up with this? I, it, the organization is called Cedar Block. Okay. And um, yeah, they put it together. It's very well thought out, mm -hmm. but um, there were some things about it that we didn't. Yeah, so out. it's using a fuel. I can see I that. Uh, and then there is some kind of a rod that it heats up uh so it, it's it's so the fuel is isopropyl alcohol yeah and then we have a copper tube with a hole in it mm -hmm. uh, and then we and attach the from, yeah there's like cotton wicks that pull the fuel up from the bottom mm -hmm. into the copper coil you heat the coil and now there is a flame there's a flame well yeah. where is the flame the flame is coming from a little hole in the copper coil so uh -huh. the fumes are coming out of once it's been heated so if you zoom in so the there, ipa is in can you draw it it's Just, in that mason jar so you have something like this uh, this is the coil so yeah let's draw the the technical diagram so where would the fuel be so Clearly, there is a cavity. Okay, so there is a fuel in the jar. And then you have something. You have wicks mm -hmm. along the way. And then you have this flame coming up here. Okay. And the flame is coming from like a little hole in the copper tubing. Okay. Because uh, the fumes are being pushed out and they combust because it's hot. Yeah. And then you have to put down this one. 
for maybe four years mm-hmm. and things like that. Mm-hmm. And what's driving the what's driving the flow? So the weights are. Why flowing. doesn't the? Uh, I guess you're keeping. I mean, on the safety side, you want to make sure that the whole IPA doesn't just light up. That would right. be bad, right? Right. Um, but I think after you do that, the wicks don't go all the way throughout the copper tubing. Uh-huh. Um, just, just It's hot enough that it evaporates IPA. Mm-hmm. It changes the vapor pressure. Mm-hmm. So then, and it rises because it's lighter. Mm-hmm. And then you light up the. So when you started, how do you start it? Started by taking the lighter and holding it to the copper tubing, which does the same thing, which heats up the process. So it's using heat as a way to create the vapor first, but making sure. So let's start safety first. What are the? Where are the flaws? Like amongst this is being used massively. Are there incidents that people report? What's what's the safety criteria? So the safety is honestly like... I mean, I have to say, I love the idea. It's phenomenal. It just, because it's something that you feel like I can just put together, mm-hmm. which is really what you want to give to a population that's just completely uh, disfranchised, it would be phenomenal to improve this. Uh, okay, so safety. So yeah. safety, the, the nice thing about this is if this were to fall over, because like if you have a tent setting, yeah. you, know, stuff you around, kick like it and you're around, sleeping, like you, it, you know, mm-hmm. it falls down. Um, if it falls over, the copper tubing fills with the alcohol and then the flame goes out. So like, there's never any like... There's have any, you tested it? We have. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's totally you guys did some totally videos. Fine. No videos. Okay. No, yeah. Really. yeah. Can we make it like tomorrow and <laughs> just take some videos and on Thursday, we can do a test outside. Uh, but, uh, I can see how long it takes. Part of the um, part of what we want to improve yeah. is the time it takes to build it. Yeah, um, so yeah. We we'll get to it. Videos. So do safety first. Do a build on the other side and kind of efficiency. But let's, you know, I think this is a slightly different type of a project in which you've done round one. Now it's really time to take a step back. It's like it's one option that nothing needs to be improved. All we need to do is massively scale it. The other option is, no, 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 there are still some really fundamental, important things. Let's tackle them first. And it might be that I'm jumping to safety just because safety is one of the biggest things when you are trying to build sets of products. Uh, Okay, so that's following. We can talk more about this in terms of features that are built in uh, or could be built on the safety. Other, anybody else can come up with safety issues around, or I mean, from your experiences you know, talking to people. That I'm thinking about is like fumes and because of alcohol. It's yeah. Burning, so. so first of all, uh, carbon monoxide was no the monoxide. okay. Uh, it's a clean fuel. Mm-hmm. Where? What's the source of the IPA? The isopropyl alcohol. Like, is that from Walgreens or something yeah, like that? Like, uh, so it's yeah, medical yeah. grade. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so just write that on the medical grade side. So if you do fumes, bracket medical grade. Because one thing is, if you broadly make and advertise something like that, other places, people might not have access to IPA. They're still cold. It's like, oh, I'll just put this. Mm-hmm. Is there something that you should not put in this? Just like we tell everybody in laser cutter. What is the one thing you're not supposed to cut in a laser cutter? People from PRL or you go in shops. What is the one thing? How many of you have used a laser cutter here? What is the one thing that if you put it, something will eat your brain? Quite literally, there is a gas that you will make and it'll actually eat your brain. It's important for your safety, you guys should know. So there are some plastics that will make fluorine gas. So you never put plastics that have fluorine in it, like Teflon and other, Mm -hmm. there's lots of plastics that have fluorine in it. And it makes uh, HF and a couple other gases. So it should. Now, if when you go to your laser cutters, please put a sign there. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's something that. So, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, it's just like plastic. And there's there's some things that you should just not put, right? And again, you know, I it's it's valuable. And especially if we were to think about this in the context of climate, I mean, I'm I'm reminded of a conversation in Mongolia, where if you look at the at the coldest time, uh, and again, this is also true in India. If some of you have seen, 
uh, the primary thing that people burn are carburetors. Carburetors are, I mean, this is just a sidetrack in terms of what are people currently doing. Uh, uh, if I'm going to just, if you unshare your screen for a second, I'll just show, and is there a browser here? Uh, right there. New tab. I just want to show you guys kind of the carburetor burning uh, carburetor burning even. This is basically a part in a car uh, and images. Getting me people's carburetors that burn. Cold jelly. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Yeah, can you just share that? Um, just, uh, I mean, it is a broader, uh, it's a broader problem. Uh, and I think one important to, to just understand this is in the context of the toxicity, uh, there is a class of things. And just, I mean, you might be thinking and starting with tents, which is a very good narrow group to focus. It's actually very valuable to focus in the context, say, if you've decided that US city is what you're after first. Uh, and then we can broaden it out. It's like, oh, by the way, this actually turns out because this is a massive issue currently in the context of what's burned. And, you know, many a times people would literally burn plastic bags. Plastic burns actually quite well, but they are inhaling all of the uh, HF and everything. And it has a huge toxicity issue that you're not even thinking about. And that goes beyond just that individual. It's actually fuming everywhere. Uh, okay, so let's keep going on safety. Other, other threads on safety. Um, amount of time, like we're just getting to now the fun so functional requirement safety is a huge functional requirement. Like there is, it's almost a go no go check that unless a product meets these sets of criteria, you would not introduce it. And especially because you're thinking of releasing it as a open build your own framework, which I'm assuming this has been, then it's the ownership of safety is even higher. Right, because people won't build it exactly as you might have thought about. Uh, okay, other functional requirements. Uh, I think one thing you guys said was cost and build time, right? Uh, so what aspects of the, actually, before we even get there, what's the efficiency? What's yeah, so that's, the, yeah. That's something that I think we had an issue with. Mm -hmm. um, does it actually warm? So it does actually warm. We mm -hmm. did get reports like from board managers that it did keep people warm. Yeah. They were able to do well, mm -hmm. but um, I would say that one issue with like efficiency for us is that in that original document, they say you should be able to use seventy percent isopropyl alcohol, mm -hmm. and it should work just fine. Mm -hmm. Well, we use you mean to dilute it with water or something else, or like you, when you go to the store today, okay, like seventy percent or ninety yeah. percent, yeah, they're like anything it's above seventy percent should work. Yeah, seventy percent is cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like that should work. Well, we tried seventy percent. We tried to light it. it. The flame was the size of like a candle flame. And the, the flame is supposed to be much bigger than that. And yeah. we were like, well, this is weird. Okay, so and we were like, not the... sure if we had done something wrong with the copper coils and the fumes, and there was like some mm -hmm. somewhere efficient, like mm -hmm. like uh, something was being lost, right? Mm -hmm. So we switched to ninety percent, and it pretty much fixed the problem. Mm -hmm. But I think if we were using ninety percent, that switch would be even bigger. So like one yeah, thing is some, like some be issues. able to use yeah. cheaper, um, cheaper, less concentrated fuel, and it mm -hmm. still. Work. What's the cost? Like for so for me for, to stay warm one evening, yeah. what are we talking so about in terms of fuel? Hours, Assume no cost in building materials because that's something that just is you use over time. Yeah, so for five to six hours of burn time, it's about a dollar. One dollar. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for like the amount of for people to just go to the drugstore and buy like in a small like yeah. one bottle, like yeah. not in bulk, but it could be cheaper if you buy in bulk, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, it's about a dollar for like six hours of playing time. Yeah. Maybe more. And then um, the other efficiency issue was this was something that we I discovered when I was distributing them versus like when we were doing it in our dorm and trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Um, was like we were like outside, it was cold, kind of windy, and then trying to use the lighter to it like blows up. light the copper foil until yeah. it's lit. Yeah. It's pretty hard. Like you need to protect it from the wind. Yeah. And then you needed the coin to get really, really hot. So sometimes you were sitting there with the lighter on for like 30 to 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. At that point, it's like, how many times can you lose this lighter? Like you're never find out. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. usually. And that makes a lot of sense because you're not using a pressurized source. I mean, everybody know I. For the vacuum we were discussing, I talked about the kerosene lamps. You guys know the kerosene lamp? It's almost literally the same thing, except there is a tiny little pump as well, which pressurizes and creates vapor based on pressure rather than heat. So you can do either, you know, in phase change of materials, you can either change phase using pressure, you can change using heat. And so that's another, framework and it's as a for starter that's what's hard uh, but then you basically what you do is you pump for 10 seconds and then you light it up mm -hmm. and then again you know there's a, a trick around it to making sure you don't spill the fuel around uh, so okay start time is one uh, but what I meant efficiency was in terms of converting molecules burned to the amount of heat in a tent like all heating systems have this efficiency number from an electrical. And it might be that there's a technology crossover right now that simple batteries uh, might get us there. And it's actually very interesting to do that calculation. What is so beautiful about most of these uh, hydrocarbons is just the density of energy per unit mass is really hard to beat batteries come nowhere close to that. So I think in some sense, that's kind of an interesting scenario, but you guys should just do that calculation. So you feel like, oh, we understand. This is why we're using it. Yeah, our only Even though the, the drawback that I would say is IPA being so readily available and so cheap in many places around the world would be tricky. Uh, so it would also be interesting to think about if you could broaden the fuels. So one... Uh, functional requirement can really be is around fuels. Uh, so which is a separate from efficiency. Uh, it's a little bit around like another categorization is can you take this idea and make it global? But then it has to fit the broader context of other places. I was thinking about the whole because I was thinking about the camper, mm -hmm. the ones that you use with pressurized air, you have like this a valve to put in more fumes or less. If you have more holes, you could theoretically make a bigger flame. Because that is the same concept, right? Of, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it depends. It depends on what the temperature, the geometry. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing we should do hope is I think both for the ostomy bag and this one, I really want to get teams access to console. So I know Ian and you guys played with it. It looks like it is available, right? It's just a bicycle. No, but is it? Yeah. Um, console like the FDA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have it at the PNL. Yeah, but I just want to make sure that the class has it on their computers for some teams. Let's walk through it. I think there was a Stanford option, especially for classes, and then Ian found that we just have to do the CMGH thing. Just talk to him to figure out where that is. I think for both of these problems, so what's really happening is, if you were to say, what is the design of the coil? How many holes do you put? That's just a function of the, the flow of the gas through this chamber, and you might be where like, for example, if somebody says, hey, I want to heat up not a small tent, but a bigger room. Like, do you make that thing bigger? That doesn't work uh, that well. Like, what is the scaling associated with it? Is it better to light up multiple of them? Uh, and then how do you switch it off? What's the, you blow it out or? Yeah, you can blow it off. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. There's no, uh, you don't have to wait for it to, uh, yeah. Uh, and then any incidents reported in like all of the usage so far or the stuff that you guys gave out or any, anything on the site, do they list some do's and don'ts with it? So, you know, there is the one don't that kind of, I'm sure all of you know this, so I'll say this. Everybody knows what petrol bombs are. 
You guys don't know. Okay. Uh, so when riots happen, sometimes a liquid fuel is used in a glass bottle with a little flame on the top. But then if it cracks, that causes a massive explosion. So one thread here is like if something falls, if this object falls on the ground, uh, that's bad. Mm -hmm. So I think kind of uh, impact is another one to think because then it's a petrol bomb effectively because that would explode. Uh, explode not from a pressure point of view, but just because the liquid goes everywhere and the liquid is lit. Uh, is there a specific reason that it's done with these mason jars and glass and not something that won't actually break? So we thought about that one, yeah. and it, we were thinking about maybe replacing the glass because it's also something that makes it heavy. Um, and it would be nice yeah, why not it. like all of these metal things that have now come out, like these metal thermoses? I think it could be metal. Um, Is it just, oh, I'm out of fuel and you don't have a readout? Um, yeah, it's easier to see. Yeah, I just don't like the glass as a. I mean, that is a very fatal. The the explosion when these things, if they break, is actually quite tricky. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, it's not as it, uh, we might be overthinking it. But on the other so hand, if you're thinking about a scaling, bit warm, like the the metal lid of the mason jar gets a bit warm, and then the glass itself could get a little bit hot. Um, yeah, but is the question is, do you want to avoid it? Do you want radiative heating? If you do want radiative heating, it's actually good for it to be metal and not glass. Uh, you know, in terms of sets of insulators, uh, the glass would get, the bottle would get super hot, uh, but then there is some other barrier too I saw in that picture. Yeah, there's right? a terracotta pot that sits yeah. on top of where the flame actually, and that's yeah. really easy to take out. Yeah, why don't, make the whole thing out of clay, like pottery style. But then it's still breakable. And very Pottery heavy. style is still breakable, unfortunately. And very heavy, because that's a big parameter. Yeah, what's the, yeah, actually, can you write weight as a criteria? Yeah, this so, is something that we thought about a lot, or something that, yeah, as we were making them, they're pretty time consuming to make. And how long does it take to make? Um, I'm confused you know, why you guys are saying that. Like, when I look at that, it's like half an hour in the shop. <laughs> I think we were having a really rough quarter, and so we had to make that outside, outside of our that class. doesn't count. <laughs> so, like, sit and, like, mix it, and then yeah. we have a car and, like, going to buy and material. Like, it, it just was time. No, 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 that, that doesn't. Way. I'm just saying so, if like, you had all the material. Why don't you guys bring all the materials on Friday, and let's build a few collectively. You guys can use all of these people as cheap labor. <laughs> Everybody will make one, and Pardon? let's test it. Pardon me, it was awesome. Do you have the parts? Um, most of them. Yeah, otherwise just give Hope the list of parts. We'll just order them. Let's have people arrive. Let's build five, ten of them. So, you know, unless we're making stuff, we can't improve any of this. Okay, we're way over time. Any other comments? I think let's just take comments from everybody else. Uh, comments online. If you unshare your screen, I can see the hands. Should we share ours? I think there were three. Oh, are there? there? Yes, you guys should share. Like sort portability of, is an important one because mm -hmm. you know this is a transient. Did population. you say portability? portability yeah. Like so weight. Can you put a number on a weight? What's the number would you put? Like how 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 heavy is the current one? Like you guys are way far ahead because you guys already worked on this problem before. So then I expect more. <laughs> like tell me exactly how much your weight was in the past. So I don't know. Like are we trying to shave off ten percent off of it? Like what was the number? Just. We'll like, yeah, think, yeah, put those numbers in because, you know, we're building upon somebody who's already massively done some, and this is also true for everybody. It's actually great to build upon solutions from the past, but then it's also very important to be concrete. Okay, other, any other criteria that didn't get discussed so far that you guys want to bring up? Yeah, I guess just assembly. Um, that would be in the build there's a, time. A couple, like, finicky, um, yeah. Yeah, I think one thing to think a little bit about is mapping it to exactly just supplies in classic Home Depot style right. threads. And yeah. even further down, like, you know, can I go to a bicycle store? Like when I think about making this in Senegal, I don't have a Home Depot. I don't have a, I'm thinking about a completely different fuel. And I know the store that I would go to is the bike store, the bike store and the motorcycle and the car garage, because cars have lots of tubings and I have all the sets of parts. So I think this is that, that broadening the context, the global side of the story, is that the construction design is very US-centric, and you might think of replacement parts in, say, let's start with India, or start with Senegal, one more place. Because, uh, you know, I think it's just 
maybe Senegal, it doesn't get so cold. India, it does get very, very cold. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mongolia would be one that would be phenomenal to think about, especially because Mongolia has a lot of air pollution because of uh, kind of unsustainable heating solutions. Uh, I see Pavan's hand, and then let's jump to any last minute urgent comments, kind of things that so, people... I was only thinking, like, I don't know if I missed this. Uh, is there a reason why we're not considering the conventional kerosene lamp we use in India, which was brought up earlier? Is it the suit is the only reason, or is there any other concern? Is it just the suit and the air quality which gets affected? Is that the reason why? Yeah, we don't I think consider? the suit is the biggest one. Uh, and I yeah. think the kerosene lamp is something that you guys should look at the design of. So Because it's lamp. super robust in the sense that there are spares of literally every single thing, and it's super cheap. It's like 300 rupees in India, which is about $3. It's fully yeah, made of... For metal. cooking and just yeah. heating, Pavan is a longer exposure in a closed area. Yeah. Like, yeah. I wouldn't use yeah. a kerosene lamp. That would be very dangerous from a carbon monoxide point of view. I, and I think it's, just, it's just thinking a little bit about it. That's probably really where this whole IPA thread initially came from. So my intuition is we should read a little bit of the history of it because it's also important to credit the sets of people that came up with it and what is the history. My intuition is somebody first came up with it primarily from IPA as a fuel because medical supplies have it in abundance in the US. And then like what is a minimal number of parts that are needed to turn that into a source of heat? It's actually a really clever idea because they're exploiting the supply chain that's already present and transitioning it. Uh, but again, I think Pavan is right. You guys should look at current heating solutions in emergent markets too, because they would be very portable. Reverse. You can use the hardware, but use the better fuel source. Yeah, yeah. I think that really was... Um... Prop that up and just focusing on yeah. current existing like yeah. Camping utilities. Yeah, yeah, but go beyond camping. Go kind of in international markets. There's a very classic uh, gas-based heat source, and I think it doesn't work in this context because there are dependent supply chains then that you can't rely on. So I think I still feel that the this there is a gap to fill here, uh, but I think the efficiency might be a really important thing to think about, like bring science and physics to this design at this point it kind of works like even if you improve it by 20 30 percent that is cost efficiencies in the fuel like tunability like can a person tune is like oh this is getting too hot we often take that for granted in our heating sets of solutions could you simply add a type of a valve like a bicycle valve or something very very simple uh, we have some diaphragm valves uh, uh, that we've been using and it's uh, it has to be like a metal valve and so I think you know just whether that's even a need is it sometime that oh now I want it's a cold day this should be on full power and it's not a cold day and I'm just uh, I'm gonna save on the fuel that I have I think that was one of our is it in the list that would be a really fun one because to do that you have to fundamentally understand how it works and that would be really fun because that way you would go down and break it apart and build it again. Uh, okay, I think we're gonna switch topics. Uh, let's go to solar powered water generator uh, and then we'll just go down that list. Uh, after that is microplastics uh, and we'll see how far we go in terms of timing. Uh, we. Does everybody okay if we go a little longer today, like 11.30, which is, does that work for people or no? How many of you have a hard stop at 11? Okay. The class time is 11.30 though. 11.20, you have a hard stop. Can we go to 11.20? Everybody here is okay? Yeah, I just wanna cover as many we can because we won't be doing this again. Uh, and it's important that everybody gets, yes. Your team is not there. Oh, it's it, I was going to swim, but I have okay. to duck out at eleven. You want to go earlier? In the yeah. So if I can go earlier, you can go. Why don't you go next? Yeah, yeah. Where are you interviewing? 
Um, it's for an RA position. Okay. <laughs> See. Um, yeah. Yeah. Who is in your team? Anybody else? Uh, it's just me right now. Yeah. So if I'm going to wait for this one, we go soon. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, do a Fred Park. Yeah. Okay. I do a Fred Park. I it's on the team spreadsheet. Uh huh. Um, I put it in a link there, but I can give you some profits in the meantime. Yeah. Tell us the problem. And then the whole purpose of this discussion is narrow, 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 and use everybody here. This is the your one chance to get ideas from everybody. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, and kind of use the functional requirements as a way, and we might not focus on all of them, but just one of them. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So I want. So to it's, look... is this the inverse problem of what yeah, we just I know. discussed? So That's great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Did everybody get that? So it, we're just, rather than heating a tent, we're going to cool a tent now. <laughs> okay. So the issue that I'm working on is essentially working on making efficient and cheap cooling systems. Um, so I can write down my functional requirements. Um, so I want to... And then if you have it on your screen, why don't you just share your screen? I got it. Okay. Oh, okay. oh perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. So I want to cool down... 10 degrees Celsius. Um, and then my second. How big an area? Um, the kind of. I wasn't thinking area, but I was thinking volume. people. Okay. People. Um, yeah. No, you have to think in volume, right? Really? Yeah, just from an energetics point of view, cooling the whole planet down by 10 degrees C would require a ton of energy. Yeah. Cooling this room less, a tent maybe even less. Just think a little bit about what context are you thinking about? You're thinking yeah. it in a context of a home, I'm assuming. Yeah. Right. Home. Yeah. Um, so maybe a one room house yeah. where there are four people. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. So one room homes are often one fourth of this uh, room, basically. Yeah. So just, I would say, let's do a two meter by two meter by two meter space. Just as a the test case. I've encountered with looking at it as a volume problem is mm -hmm. I was thinking about mm -hmm. radiative cooling, mm -hmm. and then I'm not sure if there is a more efficient way to do that than like using radiative cooling to cool down a lot of space, as opposed to figuring out a way to just. Yeah, I think you could flip the problem around. Uh, it's okay to try to exploit radiative cooling. The trick there that I'm kind of referring to is make sure that the solution you're making is to be used by someone. And if it's used by someone, start with that location. Where do they live? Okay. Because then otherwise it might not be transportable. Yeah. And so just, it doesn't matter if the solution or an idea that you have, just project it to see this is the kind of home that I'm assuming it's a home setting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or like a classroom would be a fun one. Yeah. Like just, so just then let's deal with a classroom in this country, for example. Okay. Because okay. the baseline temperature matters. Okay. So which country... I'm or where, really which particular location? A classroom in India. Okay, let's do a classroom in India. Uh, I'm assuming, say, somewhere, do you know where? Like, what is the mean temperature? Uh, uh, because India, it varies massive. Yeah, I mean... So are we talking about 40 Celsius? Okay. So like, it should be... Celsius. You should take a challenging problem. <laughs> right? Okay. Like, when it's 40 C, if you're in a classroom, I don't think any of you would pay attention to me or anyone else. Okay. This is a huge issue, right? So if you're just so uncomfortable, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I like that. So classroom in India at 40 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. And what the second requirement was to use less energy than a traditional air conditioner. So. And then in, uh, in terms of, uh, I think, what would be valuable to think is put some numbers down. This is the power requirements. This is the wattage. Yeah. Uh, what does the, and again, you know, one challenge a little bit is uh, around, uh, are you using electricity itself as a primary? Because there is the other route of non-electric mechanisms and methods of thinking about cooling. Yeah. yeah. So the, yeah, that's why I was saying less yeah. energy because I wasn't sure if I wanted to go fully of like non-electric or mm -hmm. I mean I think the idea is to in the idea space you want to set your problems and then massively populate this. You know, termites know how to cool their homes. Mm -hmm. They don't use electricity. Beautiful sets yeah. of 
things that have been done that you can think about it. And it's just something to put out here. Like the idea here is to populate this board with massive number of ideas. So your functional requirements shouldn't constrain your solution space too much. Okay. Later on, you could say, ah, not reliable enough. You can still cancel that out. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, less energy than a conventional AC is good. Okay. Most places in schools across India, there is no power. Yeah. So that doesn't work. So yeah. you have to think about it. So you can fork, you can divide it into eventually, whether it's electric or non-electric. Yeah. Okay, what are the, any other uh, kind of requirements? Yeah, so then the other requirements I had was easy to install. You don't need a professional. Um, and then the last one was um, easy to purchase. Um, so one thing that I was thinking about is like the main mode of transportation a lot of people have is motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about something that could be transported within that mm -hmm. and not needing to get. Yeah. So you build kind of, uh, you assemble it yeah. at site. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think, you know, that's, that's definitely, let's just start with concepts and what have you been thinking about? That's yeah. a pretty challenging problem. Yeah. Uh, Cause that's a huge temperature differential. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so let's just throw ideas, and then at this point, everybody should throw ideas on the board. But you should go ahead. What are the ones that you've been thinking about? Yeah, so the two main things that come to mind were fans. Um, but the problem with fans is that you need electricity. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to find a creative way such that you wouldn't need electricity. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that I had for the fans was potentially selling massive blades and then letting people custom cut the blade size that fits their home. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned this around that blade size impacts dramatically the efficiency of a fan and circulation. Yeah. So do you have a calculation or has anybody done that calculation? Yeah, so there is this company, uh -huh. and excuse my language, called Big Ass Fans. Okay. Um, they've like patented their technology. Great marketing <laughs> yeah. for whatever they're doing. <laughs> Um, they've yeah. patented their fans pretty heavily, yeah. so they don't release their calculations yeah. on... Uh, That's something very system. simple that can be done. Yeah. Just the amount of air that moves in a room as a function of length of a fan. Okay. So one important thing is to just derive that scaling law. Uh, you don't even need any numerical tools for it. Very, very simply, how much air would you move as a length L in a closed room and then again, you know, the patents and things around these are only around shapes of the specific blades. Yeah. But uh, it's valuable to think about. So how large are their fans? Their diameters can go to, like, they can range. Uh -huh. There's actually a lot on campus. Like, if you go to Bogli Ariaga, they have them. Uh, and I went to how big is it? This weekend when I saw it, it was about eight feet each blade. Eight if feet is how much? I'm a meter person. It's... Mm -hmm. Um, oh, like lar yeah. longer than any one of us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, like so if it was in the middle, it would cover the whole room that two blades parallel yeah. to each other. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and there are like five blades on each, mm -hmm. um, each yeah. side. Um, then the next. And then clearly if yeah. the blades are very large, they don't spin that high mm -hmm. RPM. They probably spin at low RPM. Yeah, so they spin way lower. Because there is a phase space between the amount of air moved is what you care about, yeah. in a sense, because the way that you are feeling cold is because of the air is picking up moisture that causes evaporative cooling on a human body. That's why we feel cold when air blows on our face. Mm -hmm. But you have RPM on one axis and you have length of the blade on the other axis. So you want to draw a phase space. Does everybody understand what I mean by phase space in design? So the word phase space, sorry, I just pushed it back in. Uh, this is something that you can all use in when you have multiple parameters that you're trying to optimize. Uh, this is RPM, and this is the length of the blade, L. So this is length L in the problem. Uh, I have two independent parameters that I could vary, and every point here 
it might turn out that these are very, very high efficiency, which is being you're plotting in this third dimension, for example, efficiency or just Q, which is some flow rate, average flow rate felt by a person sitting down at like this when this stands like, right? Because there is turbulent air, but there is still an average Q and you could plot that average Q and it might turn out that there's some very strange uh, spaces because all kinds of strange things happen. After a certain RPM, a very large blade is unstable because it starts whopping and vibrating and it's like, this is a space that's unstable. You know, don't get to the space. Uh, and then it might turn out that, oh, for a very large short blade, this is where the efficient part is because I could still get higher Q by just cranking it up, which is what we used to do in India, for example. The blades make a massive sound and then noise is a huge issue with yeah. blades. But, and so there might be like space that exists that have equal, uh, and then I'm only looking at efficiency. Then you could say, oh, in this space, I actually care about energy. Yeah. And it might turn out that you can then plot energy for that same space. And there might still be a variation to say, oh, these are both energy efficient and has the same cooling efficiency. And again, you know, this can be a very simple computational exercise, mm -hmm. uh, but you can also just do it firstly, uh, empirically, uh, you take a very simple flow meter and you go sit in Ariago and just say, <laughs> for this, I'm seeing the RPM. This is the average wind velocity I saw go into a dorm room that has a small, so you can collect that data just as a baseline. I mean, if this is an idea that you will think heavily about, yeah. it's important to now technically think about it so you can understand. And then it might turn out that once you have understood the space, the direction that you focus on is to drive it totally without electricity or yeah. some other ways of running that same scenario. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so just, just just to share, I do you have a flow meter? Or? Yeah. Okay. You can just make one. Oh, really? Like yeah, oh, just okay. what is a flow meter? It's just a motor running in reverse and a tiny little three D printed uh sort of little propeller. So most of these fans that you buy, you know that handy fans, you should buy that too as yeah. a comparison <laughs> because that will act as another you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. You've all seen this thing that spray, yeah. since you're working on cooling, yeah. compare that efficiency. Would it be better to just give every kid that? And again, you know, it has batteries, it has all kinds of other things. This is much better, yeah. but it's important to compare whether it's a personalized cooling. And that can also work in reverse to actually get, I'll see if we have a, a we do have some flow sensors. Yeah, so I think it's uh, Honeywell makes these very nice flow sensors. And then uh, there's a little bit of, uh, when we built our ventilator, we were very precisely measuring. So we can give you some of the more expensive flow sensors and some of the electronics around how to get readouts from that is also there. Cool. Yeah. Okay. yeah. No, I think it would be really fun if, I, I love the context, so it, it would be valuable to start with measurements also. Yeah, that's useful. And luckily there's a lot on campus, so that works well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second idea that I was exploring was radiative cooling. Okay, I'll do that too. Um, and this is kind of, it's both simple and a complicated process, at least for me to understand. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you imagine us as humans, we're always giving off like thermal radiation to cool off. So the idea is that all objects do this. And so is there a way that you could efficiently do this in a manner that more effectively passively cools people. Um, there's a study done by MIT where they created one out of very easy to access metals um, and would put it on rooftops. But they're currently also trying to patent their idea. So they didn't reveal what was in it, but I think it could be easily replicated using yeah. what we know. So one important thing you guys should remember, and just this is a comment around IP in general, uh, the the roots of all of these ideas go back to a very long time. So people for the last hundred years, or actually I would say even thousands of years have been thinking about radiative cooling. In the early days, people used to do it because they, un 
they didn't understand it, but they figured out that this is a common way. So radiative cooling is used, for example, in India for thousands of years to cool water, right? Just very classic way to. Uh, and then, of course, the whole name of the game is to make sets of things more and more efficient. And then others can take an approach where uh, it's still a valid approach. You can still be thinking about it while certain sets of groups are it's important. These are important problems. So you shouldn't at all feel worried that other people are also working on it. Yeah. What you should just think about is learn what they did. They have a route to take. But you need to think about it and then recreate that process yourself too. Not worrying too much about, oh, you know, you're not trying to recreate uh, what others are doing. But from first principles, where would you want to go? And in that process, you would understand much more deeply the challenges. Because every set of a solution that people take are trade-offs that they're making. And the trade-offs that they might have made for a very specific market that they want to serve is not a classroom in India, as it turns out, for example. And then suddenly the solution space totally changes. So defecation problem for Haiti is not the problem in Haryana, although the word sounds similar. And this is a very important, so don't be discouraged Whenever you see something like that, you should only just think it's like, oh, this must be an important problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you should walk through, get a very clear insight into what has been done in that space. Uh, but just overall, what is the actual object? Is it that uh, there is a physical material that gets put on the rooftop and it generates a thermal differential between the bottom versus the top because it's being heated? Yeah, so okay. there are a few ideas. One of the ideas is a rooftop situation, mm -hmm. radiating that back into space. And there's another... No, but that's reflective. Oh. Right? Yeah. Like, if you don't absorb enough heat, like, often enough, why do we wear a hat? Does anybody know when it's super hot? Why do we... It's We wear hats sometimes when it's hot. It's counterintuitive because you might think, do you know why? Yeah, so our head and our skull, it just starts essentially absorbing a lot more heat, but a barrier between the two gives us this thermal air insulation, and then much of that heat is reflected back. And so you end up, so it's very similar. Yeah. And But I think the value around this would be in, in your Fred Park, try writing a very detailed, here are sets of technologies that are available in the space that you're thinking about. Yeah. Um, any other comments, other other wild ideas that people have? So I was thinking like uh, generally oh, in India, right? Give me one second. Uh, I think, yeah, just one sec. And then you can unshare the... Uh, Hope, can you unshare the Fred Park? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about what they do, like it's in DC to temperature in the room, mm -hmm. but I've heard about urban hot room system where they use like this clay pot and they soak it in water and they can do some of the process of evaporation to help. Cool. Yeah, this is basically to cool water. Yeah. And that's a very classic thing that's done uh, because evaporation itself uh, leads to cooling and this is force. Uh, and, you know, I think, yeah, the question is, um, the differential that's converted in that space is actually internal, though. Uh, I see a raised hand. Was that Pavan or somebody else had yeah. a comment around radiative yeah, yeah, cooling? Yeah. Go ahead, Pavan. Yeah, so uh, it was on the signs of water. So, like in India right now, um, yeah, the thing is you get these USB-powered fans which have these tiny lithium-ion batteries is something which is what people use in um, in trains and places when they, there is no electricity at times. Yeah, I was thinking if you can couple that with these uh, humidifiers that you get very easily. They're super tiny humidifiers that you get that are used for makeup, which I don't fully understand how it works, but it, they, they create a fine mist on the face to improve yeah, moisture. essentially an ultrasonic transfer. Ultrasonic music, exactly. Yeah. If you put that and then like couple the fan with the ultrasonic mist, it kind of cools down is at least not in the super humid areas. Uh, that's one way to enhance yeah, the cooling. There, is, there are a couple of fans uh, here, Pavan, in which it's they a combined fan combined. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is great. 
it means that uh, ideas that you all think about are relevant and important that somebody else built one. Uh, but it's it's important to think a little bit about. I think the way that I would crack the problem is to just, is it really true that the right way to approach these problems is personalized cooling? I mean, we are entering a future which will be much warmer. And maybe one way of thinking about it is that just like sound or other things, we now carry earbuds in our ear rather than blasting sound anywhere. I think it's a conceptual thing to because that will change the directions. Late. I was gonna yeah. say for the mist and fan idea. Mm -hmm. So I was in Saudi Arabia in July. Yeah. So that's like, pretty hot. Tell us how hot. Actually, I'm curious. Let's do a quick no. vote. What is the temperature that you've been in? Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. I think it's working now. I think it reset it. It's fine. Has anybody it's been good. here in temperature above 46 okay. degrees right. Celsius? Yeah. What was that? No problem. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. 50? Yeah. 47. You guys should carry your record because we're about to break all those records. Yes. But when I was there, it was funny because they had, like, it wasn't individualized, but it was like a giant fan outside that had the mist. Yeah. But it was colder when I would go outside in the mist when I was inside with the AC. Like, it, the, the yeah. fans were yeah. amazing. Yeah. Like, Can you when, share that on Discord? Yeah. I'll, like? I'll find it and I'll yeah. send the. And like, it was outdoors, so there was not yeah, even. Yeah, it was a giant fan. I mean, the fan itself wasn't huge. I mean, obviously, it was like yeah. on a large pole, so I'm sure maybe yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. a pole would be small, but yeah. like, it didn't look like eight feet by eight feet. Like, yeah. it was still going pretty fast. Yeah. Like, but it was completely outside. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll see if I can a, get pictures too and I'll send it. Closed space. Yeah, no, this yeah. is outside. Yeah, but it was it's like actually very cooler outside with that mist fan than when yeah. I was inside and there was AC. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, I think it's uh, uh, yeah, I love the the large fan thread and thinking a little bit about just the energetics of it, because and the stability of it, and it's counterintuitive in some sense that if. What would be really beautiful is because regular fans already exist. All you do is unscrew this and you mount your blades and those blades are just different. Mm -hmm. And the motor that's powering it is sufficient to power because the torque on large fans will be higher, right? Both the weight and the torque is an issue. These things are hanging off at the ceiling. Uh, and so there is a limit of weight that you want to put safely. Yeah. And thinking a little bit about what could you use that currently already exist in the motor side of the space and only the blades are changing. Mm -hmm. Like if, uh, and then again, you know, it has to be done safely. Uh, safety is a little bit of the thread too. It's, uh, I don't know. It's, I see. Yeah. Can you share that on yeah. Discord? Yeah. Uh, okay. I think we're out of time unless anybody has any other urgent comment. Uh, let's switch, and it's also 11, by the way, in oh, case you have to run. Uh, okay, uh, let's switch to solar-powered water, and then we're going to jump to microplastics. And then, who all is in your team? Uh, Sanshi and one other person. Okay, are they, are they online? Yeah. Sanshi is online. Okay, yeah. Do you guys want to share a Fred Park? Oh, did you take a picture of that? Yes. Okay. Just got it. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, and if you want, somebody else can also take notes while you're just... Oh, you already shared your screen. Yeah. So our, I guess, issue is um, providing like, safe drinking water, and we want to do that by using some type of device that's off the grid, and we're looking at solar power and using an atmospheric water generator. So fog catchers, or? Sorry? Did that what you meant? Fog catchers? Or? 
No. No. Okay. Well, there's actually a few different technologies mm -hmm. for uh, atmospheric water generators. So there's like condensed co condensators, mm -hmm. um, which like cools the air mm -hmm. and. But the source, the source of water is really atmospheric. Yes. Right. That's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just to put the context first, because this is technology, uh, what is the physical location that you're thinking about? Yeah. yeah. So I was looking at Ethiopia. They have one of the highest, uh, like, water insecurity rates mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. and so that's what the yeah. preliminary numbers are based yeah. off of. Yeah. So yeah, our first one. This was uh, just interesting because there's a, a few different ways to, I guess, look at this technology. And so the first parameter being low cost. And and I think there was kind of two main ways to reduce cost. The first being reducing the uh, cost of producing the energy, and then the second being reducing the cost of actually producing the water, like the condensator part, or at least the technology that like, mm -hmm. captures but the But just before, the functional requirement being, what are the key requirements you're trying to meet? So, Paul, it has to be drinking water, right? So the cost comes after when we have understood the space. So, so drinking water, how much water do you want this object? Is it a personal solution? Is it something that would be put as a large plant, mm -hmm. how much water does it need to make per day? Yeah, that was something I was thinking about, yeah. whether it should be like intended for, for like a large- Yeah, so just for this energy. discussion, let's yeah. choose one direction. I was gonna, I was gonna do- um, Is it like something that a family buys and puts on their roof? More and so you like basically village, get like for a village. Okay, so a hundred people drinking water, for example, at least. Yeah. Right. Just it's valuable to think about the scale. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are the other functional requirements? Yeah, it's an independent from electric grid, and it's functional in semi-arid regions. Mm -hmm. So in climates of around like yeah. fifteen to twenty percent humidity. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and supply water per day for a hundred people. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Also efficient. So. Just yeah, so if you just do that number for that arid, is there even enough water? Like, by total mass, mm -hmm. is there enough water in the uh, kind of the air to even, even if your system was 100% efficient? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? There right. will be a fundamental cutoff right. in this problem right. that yeah. if you cut off below a certain point, no matter how efficient your system is in sucking out water from air. Uh, so I think you should do that number somewhere because it will give you this sense of thinking about the scale that you have to work with, like how much volume of air are you trying to process? Yes. I think if you were to add a fan to pull a lot of air through, mm -hmm. you'd be able to increase the amount of water. Yeah, that way. yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't, I mean, there is still a limit just associate the energy that you use in moving air yeah. and just the total amount of air associated. Mm -hmm. But it might also just be that it's uh, it's valuable to just understand in this space, what is the world record right now, for example, in these. I mean, it's very similar to CO2 capture thing. People know and understand per unit dollar, this is what you can do. So per unit dollar, what is the current number for these atmospheric capture technologies. Do you know for a glass of water? I guess it depends on the technology. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. Just, but you should do it for different mm -hmm. sets of tools, just so that the ones that you're thinking about, uh, because that will give you the context of the, like, oh, it does make sense in a context of Ethiopia, yeah. or it must exist but we don't really as yet have a deeper uh, understanding of, you need a fundamental jump in your capture efficiency to make it sustainable for Ethiopia. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. And I guess um, that kind of all that was also like the set solar power technology itself, like uh, the solar cells are pretty expensive and can require materials that are 
are mm -hmm. not super acceptable to just take in like low resource settings. Mm -hmm. So So that I would just tell you that the world in the last five years has changed. Mm -hmm. There is a massive reduction in price. So anybody who can build projects on solar, do it. It's the world and it is so dramatically falling at those prices that it's shocked everybody who was even a solar proponent. Mm -hmm. So even the current sets of prices, but there is gonna be, they, they will continue to fall as more and more projects. And I think it was just, I'll, I'll pull out some of these numbers and post on your Discord. Uh, that the timing is very interesting. Like five years ago, uh, what you said would be true. And then suddenly there has been a very dramatic adoption of uh, solar power, which is very exciting. Yeah. Like I think in a, in a very positive light that you could even draw more energy per unit dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ethiopia being Ethiopia with so much sunlight, it would right. make a lot of sense to think about it. Right. Yeah. So I think you're considering like what is the most efficient technology that uh, like for the least amount of power mm -hmm. Yeah. So just for this discussion, can you sketch out what is the physics behind capturing water from air? Like, what are the common methods that people have played with? Yeah. The first one is, like, some type of condensation. So you cool and you essentially get water and you get these droplets out, right? Yeah, so it... Like lowers the air to its dew point mm -hmm. and then yeah. collects it by cooling it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And like it circulates like some type of detergent. yeah. That's kind of when we have cold water, you start seeing or uh, you start seeing water condensate. Okay, yeah. that's one. The next main one is like using some type of hydroscopic material. Uh huh. Do everybody know what which, the word hydroscopic means? Which like uses like absorption uh -huh. slash absorption yeah do folks online know the word hygroscopic so everybody is uh at least some of you here might have air plants you guys have you know what air plants are right you have air plant you should totally get an air plant okay. because air plant exactly use this air plants uh don't require any soil don't require you to water so where does the water come from they actually have these trichomes, and this could be a really fun full scope exercise for you guys. Go find an air plant and look at the leaf of an air plant, and you will find these incredible structures that uh, it uses to capture water using a hygroscopic mechanism. But again, it's a geometry that they create, uh, and they are also just fun at home, so air plants are fun to get. Uh, but there is a just on the surface of this plant, you will find an example of a remarkable hygroscopic material. Uh, and it's also valuable to think about from a nature's perspective, like why that particular, I'm not saying what geometry it is, but it's a very particular geometry that it uses to capture water. Yeah, there's yeah. A, like, well, this, I thought the hygroscopic material was really interesting because there's a wide range of what can be done with that. Mm -hmm. There's zeolite filters, there's like metal organic frameworks that are mm -hmm. like been developed, or like some type of gel material that can like just absorb it. And then usually to release the water, say it's like heated mm -hmm. and because this is used to like capture the water mostly. Yeah. yeah. Then it's heated and then mm -hmm. condensed. Yeah. So okay, condensation materials, what are the others? Just because I want to figure out how you would narrow down because then you have to choose one mm -hmm. amongst others by certain right. criteria and then go down that rabbit hole. So which one would that be? Any yeah. others? Uh, these were the two main ones. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know where the, the fog catchers, uh, it is a geometrical, it's basically in places where there is a lot of fog that rolls in. Mm -hmm. uh, Peru is one classic example uh, where it's, uh, People have been testing and it kind of looks like a mosquito net that you hang. And in the end, just like on all spider webs, you've all seen this massive amount of water on spider webs. Uh, then there is just a mechanism to collect that back. And then the uh, it's it's a very specific, it's, it's good for high humidity. And I think this is the one thing you have to look at. 
is what does the efficiency of all of these tools look like as a function of the air humidity? Uh, because it might be that they have a very specific cutoff beyond which it requires just way too much energy. Um, other comments, threads, uh, ideas on this? And then if you just unshare your screen, that way I can see. Yeah, was it? Yeah, um, I just have a question, I guess, like, are there, so there's areas that people don't have access to any water, even like on clean water. Like, why is the solution atmospheric water generation versus just like water purification and water boiling kind of? Yeah, I think one thing was to like reduce the the cost of water. Like, and they do have access to water, but it can be like pretty expensive with like water tariffs. And also it's usually not clean. There's mm -hmm. a lot of like sanitation issues related to water. And so, yeah, another component of this was like in the safe thing was having some filtration at the end um, that saves the water. But, but also, I mean, to begin with, uh, the degree of what you have to clean is also very little. It's quite interesting that by itself, being in air, the vapor itself has a, a degree of uh, safety built in. Mm -hmm. I think one of the problems, we're not discussing it here, but, but water has a, there's a lot of politics around water. So regions across the countries, I mean, this has been happening even in California, mm -hmm. and that plays, that politics plays out in a smaller scale in sets of things of people that control. So if you, in water scarce areas, the person who controls the well is usually the wealthiest person. They don't allow anybody else to get access to the underground water. Similarly, the same thread goes on rivers and because it's just, it's so limited at that time, point. Uh, much of what's distributed by the government is actually sold in black market and other sets of, so other traditional distribution points. Uh, one space that I like about it is instead of a hundred people thing, I was thinking about a personalized thing mm -hmm. that serves a family that can be put on a roof of something. Mm -hmm. And it just brings water independence in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. And even though it might turn out, oh, at this moment, it's not viable because of energy needs. Uh, but that's exactly why, if it was possible, it would change the politics around water. And so that's why I love this space. I think the question to really think about is, uh, you have to hit hard on, there is a lot of science in this that's unknown. Mm -hmm. Like just because this is the efficiency currently doesn't mean it can be that efficiency. Like right. oh, if we can move air, suddenly you can change the game. If, if you understand the environmental conditions very specifically, can you change that? Right. And the collection efficiency in these things is also extremely low. Mm -hmm. Like it's always fragile materials that are hanging. And mm -hmm. So it's just, it hasn't really been designed properly for long-term use. What do you mean by fragile materials that are hanging? You know, just for the dog catchers, I know literally people use mosquito nets. It's just, oh, okay. it's not what these things were designed for. And yes, you get this cloth and you squeeze it and you get drinking water. It's just, you know, you really want to, the material science of this space is massive. Just like the ostomy bags I was saying, the number of materials possible is very large. Uh, Laura, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was going to say that related to what you were saying about um, like purifying the water and stuff like that. Like, I grew up in Peru and I've seen a lot of these like bug catchers, mm -hmm. and a lot of people in the You have some pictures that you can share online. Yeah, just uh -huh. on Discord. Yeah, I have pictures here, but I haven't taken pictures. Yeah, that's fine. It can be other people's pictures they too. They really look yeah. like mosquito nets. Yeah. Also. Okay. But um, a lot of people in those communities also use them for. Like for irrigation mm -hmm. more than for drinking water mm -hmm. so it's in like very like water scarce areas where they don't even have water to like do agriculture and stuff like that so that is a different thing like you don't know the different diseases but being aware that there's probably different types of these mm -hmm. dog catchers where like some of them are meant for your culture water and they probably have some type of different like material composition whereas in those communities they're used um more for like irrigation and agriculture right yeah it's a good point and i guess that also yeah. just comes down to like availability yeah. and stuff like for that application then it's probably going to be like a much larger scale but yeah honestly our group we we have a scheduled meeting so we'll really talk about mm -hmm. 
what we want to comment on. Yeah, I think now is the time. It's uh, okay. Uh, we have a couple more minutes. Let's let's jump on microplastics, and that'll be the last group we'll discuss today. And then we'll bring the last four, or no, the last three. No, actually, the last four. Uh, no, last three because we already did the cheap cooling. <laughs> uh, okay, Nima, Ni Niam, do you want to take it away? You should also yeah. remind me how to pronounce your name correctly. Neve. Niam. Neve. Niev. Oh, the M is silent? Like, all of it is silent, yeah. <laughs> like, like N E. -E That's the funniest thing somebody said. All of it is silent. Nia. It pretty much. So, like N E E V, like that. Oh, Nia. Niv. With a V. <laughs> yeah. Well, which language is this from? Irish. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Take it away. Okay. Um, I'll share my screen. Okay. So we are quite a big team. Um. So just. We have, we've come up with kind good. of a, a couple, Can you just say of, the, the team members? Yeah. Um, so we have me, Ravi, um, uh, Shika, Sanchi, um, Claudia, and someone from Discord that I... Yeah. Yeah, that I, I don't know. It's either... I don't know their name, if that's their username or just their name. <laughs> Nivitia? So there's maybe about seven of us at the moment. Yeah. No, I think that's um, good. We just and, met. You know, one thing that I'll do is suggest would be is if you guys can coordinate, then it's okay to have a big team. This is a big problem. Uh, on the other hand, if you guys have, it's tough to coordinate, then we can divide and conquer and people can use specific uh, sub-functional requirements. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what I think the direction we might end up going in. We haven't decided what we're going to split up yet, but I think there might be multiple solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so our problem is uh, microplastic pollution and uh, like low cost scalable ways to detect microplastic pollution uh, in the sea or in, in bodies of water. Um, so um, we were so thinking one of- one key aspect of just as a functional requirement is you really want it to be an in-situ solution, that the solution sits in open bodies of water, or do you want it to be something that water is collected from time to time and then monitored by a person using an instrument? So just real-time continuous monitoring, which makes it harder because the solution has to be underwater or at least have a direct access or something like a microplastic uh, portable meter that you carry in your hand, and no matter what water you put in it, it gives you the microplastic content. I'm just, I think because there um, we can diverge in multiple directions. I think that's what's going to end up happening. Initially, my thoughts was to have an in-situ detector, but yeah. now we're, we're coming up with multiple kind of things. So I was thinking of a a light sheet um kind of like uh like piv um, yeah. uh something like that where you have i have a little yeah so piv is particle image velocimetry uh and what it just does is looks at particles that pass through uh i think kind of one of the this is much more of what's used in fluid mechanics just as a technique to monitor water flows uh but one of the i guess the thread that you're thinking about is that a larger volume of water being tested when it's flowing through right yeah i think uh, one one challenge just in that space to think a little bit about is this idea of where does and i know some people have to run so that's okay we'll just still continue the discussion if you care about plastic pollution stay you don't care about plastic pollution, you can walk away. Yeah, no, that's fine. I know you guys have classes. Uh, uh, the, the specificity. So the 
the PIV and many of these frameworks just give a large field of view imaging system. I think one heart of the problem is thinking about what mechanism provides specificity that it is a plastic particle, because there is a lot of detritus in all of the water bodies, and you are choosing a certain resolution that you're imaging water at. And what will end up happening is PIV, for example, is a scattering-based technique. You would get massive number of things, but not all those particles are actually, they're all organic origin. Yeah. And are not anthropogenic. So I think the specificity part is the one to handle or tackle in yeah. that. Case. Yeah. So we thought about, or I've been thinking about having, um, a filter at the end of this kind of sampler so you can validate what you're seeing and turn you know but that yeah. would get clogged quite quickly but maybe yeah, just initially before... i could see that as an instrument to validate and maybe come up with ml types of approaches to see signatures that you can see but on the other hand you know if it's lasers it's fairly easy to excite fluorescence uh, and then fluorescence, there are certain classes of fluorescence for common plastics that has been very well documented. I think the first place to start here in my mind would be is what light matter interaction phenomena do you want to exploit? So fluorescence is one. Raman is another one. Uh, there are other kinds of spectroscopic tricks and techniques you know, you can imagine I was saying capacitive uh, as another one, uh, but let's make a list of every possible thing that you could get a signature and then work backwards to say, what does the system around that look like? Yeah. Because, uh, we had um, up at the top, we kind of were going through different types of, of yeah. Um, yeah, imaging so the, that could be done. FTIR is another one. Um, and I think um, when I think about it is, uh, you know, Raman has its limits in terms of the spot sizes. Uh, yeah, because I think one challenge to remember is for it to work in a field setting, the hardest challenge has been is that a certain percentage of things grow on the plastic also. So then you get an organic signature, but it should have actually been counted as a plastic. So it's a little bit, it, it really is a stealth problem. Uh, and, you know, I think capacitive is the only method that I can think about that circumnavigates this because the dielectric of a given material, even if it's there is a surface of organic matter around, it doesn't change. Um, that's um, that's not something I'm I've heard of before. What do, exactly do you do with that kind of method? So uh, there is a large class of methods that are developed that are called kind of impedance measurements, and they are uh, you you essentially think of it as a uh, measuring capacitance because uh, an electric field passing through uh, will essentially be perturbed by a given dielectric. So if we have two metal plates and you apply a DC field, as a particle goes between those metal plates, it will have a dielectric signature that can be measured. And plastics have a very specific dielectric signatures because they're classic insulators. Uh, so I think that's the that's the space. And then you can play around with frequency. You can do a frequency chirp. So these plastics will have totally different response at different frequencies. Uh, you know, it's not an imaging-based technique. Uh, maybe another way of thinking, but because electronics is so cheap and this is infinitely faster, you could potentially imagine a uh, larger amount of volume being processed. I'll send you one paper on it. There is basically a single paper in that space that allow, and again, you know, it's a very nice way to compare and contrast against optical techniques. Uh, 
the other functional requirements is fouling is something important to think about because whenever you handle environmental samples, stuff grows on every part, every piece of the optics, something will grow on it. And so in some sense, the true in-situ detectors, this is really the hardest problem in building sensitive, real-time, long-term in-situ detectors is no matter what we put out at sea, it will just get fouled. So kind of an interesting puzzle in and itself, which is a nugget, uh, because if the if it's long term monitoring, then you have to worry about fouling of some kind. Uh, let's open up any any other sets of ideas. I mean, just on the detection side of the story, uh, what what other things can people imagine detecting plastics with? Yeah, so I'm seeing from Ravi, diffusion, Brownian. I think they are too large to have any Brownian dynamics. Uh, but what is valuable in that space is there is very specific shapes that microplastics are found in. So the optical detection, I mean, the first simple thing in your team, uh, Niav, did I get that right? Niav. Niav. Uh, the first thing we should do, Niav, is I will run a sample, local sample for you that has a lot of microplastics and just share the planktoscope data with you. You guys should process that data, segment it, and see if there is a very, I mean, this is a task that anybody could do in a day or two. See if you can build a classifier for microplastics using imaging. It'll set a baseline standard because you know, the high resolution imaging that the planktoscope does, uh, the power of it is that it's high resolution. So you really know that it's microplastic. The bottleneck is that the total volume that you're processing is low. Uh, but you know, unfortunately, the abundance of microplastics is so high that you don't have to sample that much water to actually know statistically how much plastic there is. Even one 10 ml of water will have enough particles that you'll be able to back calculate it. So you're not to, it is a problem that has transitioned. Only in pristine ecosystems do I never find, under even a microscope, I find plastic now all the time. So I'm saying that can act as your baseline because all the other technologies that you compare against, you should compare it against this uh, because that by itself is scaling and it will give you a sense of just having a lot of raw data. And then depending on wherever uh, the team is, eventually we can also figuring out sending you guys parts to assemble a planktoscope too. Yeah, and yeah. we should first get the data and you guys should start by handling the data. I'll give you the raw data and go through the segmentation process and the ML process to really have a sense for how good can these detectors get. That's good. Um, I think we were thinking of um, something that could be uh, as a cost of, like there's probably multiple versions of this, what's um, ranging from put a microscope in a box in like an angler fish and put it in, put it some in a body of water to kind of more complicated solutions, but it yeah, should be something- there is a mini version of anglerfish combined with planktoscope that we have that is ready to be put underwater. So if you already have an espresso scope, let's have you build an anglerfish and then collect some in situ data too. So the planktoscope, it's better to do that offline where you're just putting the water while anglerfish is actually ready for in situ. And then in yeah. the team, do you guys have a body of water like Neve, do you have access to a water body that's polluted? Yes. And yeah. then the folks that are in India, Ravi and other folks, I think it's valuable for you to get, or get your teeth on this problem is to see if you have access to a few bodies of water and especially if they are going in food streams, if those water bodies are actually being used in human consumption 
that will give you a better actually let's take a step back uh, we didn't talk about this what about measuring plastics in organisms and using that as a metric to test how much plastic might be there so just dig around to see if anybody quantified something like this like what if there was yeah. an animal that just loves eating plastic uh, like, what if it was the Shujo's crayfish? <laughs> uh, but I'm just thinking about copepods and some other organisms. There is this bioassimilation. So if it is true that plastic assimilates in the food chain, could we actually use a biological organism as a metric, a quantitative metric? I think just it's an orthogonal idea, but it would be fun for you guys to dig some papers. Like, what if That's human bodies OPHD. themselves are good microplastic detectors? Mm. What if in our pee, there is a signature of how much plastics that... I guess we get exposed to plastics other ways, too. So it's a little bit tricky. But yeah, it would be fun. It would be fun to kind of explore this orthogonally. Because again, you know, I think what's also very interesting is that there is a biological assimilation. Um, okay, I think we're going to call it a day for the teams that we haven't discussed. We'll pick that up soon. Uh, but make sure you guys update. And at this point, I am preferentially just turning most lecture times as working time. If people want, there are a couple of specific lectures that I want to cover, but that will depend on how well you guys are doing on team side. So the more progress you do, we can cover more content. But otherwise all time is really making progress on specific project. And so that implies that, you know, and again, the class time is just some of the time that we have extremely dedicated. If you really care about take, having a project take off, you have to kind of plan time and say, oh, I actually do have the time to execute on it. Because if it's just Fridays and these sets of discussions, I think we'll end up with phenomenal PowerPoints. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I mean, you guys could be, I'm not happy with that just because it's not going to serve a purpose that we're thinking about. So really this would be the time that you should have very clear rubber meets the road. You're every day thinking about a problem. Every day you're trying and testing the sets of funds. And then remember the deadline, uh, the project uh, funding, the larger scale funding deadline is March 15th. So that's also not too far. And then you guys are competing with everybody in the world, like, I don't have any preference for whether somebody's in the class or not in the class. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, we're gonna say yeah. bye. But, um, oh, yes. Uh, Rinald, yeah, go so, ahead. Uh, Can somebody yeah, share? Oh, Neve, could you unshare your screen? Yep. Also, Neve, you have a very cool lab behind you. Where are you sitting? I am sitting, um, this is our lab in Dublin. We work with marine invertebrates. So that usually they are in the tanks there. We have oh. tenophores. Do you have, have copepods or tenophores? Crazy microscopes. Uh, tenophores. And we feed them kind of brine shrimp or copepods. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe let's separately talk about marine biology sometime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Rinal. Yeah. So uh, I just want to have a bit you on the Ethiopia thing. Yes. I heard that they responded, right? Yeah, uh, I, we called them and uh, we talked to them uh, to uh, Mr. Hennick, and he's the country director. So he was saying that um, he, he told us that we could have a meeting. Uh, like he said that we could hold a meeting today, but we weren't able to. I, I, I tried calling him, but I think he, he, he they were busy in some meeting, so he told that he called back later. So we'll try calling him tomorrow morning at ten. That's the time. We can make tomorrow that. morning work. Just tell me the time. Is it eight a.m.? Eight fifteen would be ideal for me. Eight fifteen Pacific time. 8.15 Pacific time. Okay, um, I know, uh, like 8.15 uh, a.m. in the morning, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm happy. I'll make I'll make the time work. Just tell me the time that they are available. So, I'll figure out a way. Uh, I'm not yeah, teaching I, I, tomorrow. Like, uh, so uh, 8.15 a.m. Uh, Pacific time would be okay with you, right? Say that again? You're saying 8.15 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, yeah? Yeah, yeah. That would be ideal, but frankly, I can make any time work. Okay, I think, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so yeah. we usually call them at 10 a.m. in Indian time. Yeah. Like that, that's I think two, 10 a.m. Indian hours. time is evening my time. That also is fantastic. In the night, yeah. after 
9 p.m. my time, I work on till 2 or 3, and so that would be also okay. So I, I, I will try to catch him uh, tomorrow, like, at 10 a.m. That's when we usually call Yeah, him. that and would then, be uh, my then... evening time. Just send me a text message. Yes, so uh, what about the day after tomorrow? I think we'll call him tomorrow, and we can set up a meeting.